Hey, it's Monday night. Time for voiceover body shop. We got a superstar with us tonight. That's right. Right here in the studio. Right here in the studio. Joining us here in Sherman Oaks in our one little studio, Scott Brick's going to be with us tonight. We're going to talk about audiobooks and some other cool stuff that he's doing right now, which would be really cool. Very nice. Tech-wise, anything interesting going on? Well, I was just at NAB, so I'm sure oh, I'll come up with some talk about that something I saw at NAB. that I thought was interesting, of course. All right. <laughs> All that and more coming up on VoiceOver Body Shop. We'll be right here, right now. Two men. Twin sons from different mothers, with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together, in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no-holds-barred, myth-busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars, and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products. Source Elements, remote connections made even easier. VO2GoGo.com, everything you need to be a successful voiceover artist. J. Michael Collins Demos, award-winning demo production. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voiceover website won't be a pain in the butt. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Hey, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or VOBS. All right. Well, we've reached another Monday night in our seventh <laughs> year of doing this show. And, and I'm back in the studio, thank goodness. It's good to have you back. You know, it's it's lonely when you're when you're not here. Of course, we had about <laughs> ten people in here last week with <laughs> yeah. Tim Friedlander, and that made things not a little too bit lonely. Low. Yeah, no, I mean, we had people <laughs> stuffed in here. It, it looked like the stateroom scene for monkey business. It was uh, it was pretty bad in here. Anyway, uh, tonight on our show, Scott Brooks going to be joining us. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about audio books and a book he just wrote. Amazing. Oh. Yeah, and a bunch of other things. We're going to attempt to do Daw View tonight because people are always asking about markers. Mm. And you've got stuff from NAB. Yeah, i got some stories I can share. Okay, well, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> All right, well, let's get the show on the road here. It's now time for... Voice of Body Shop presents the VOBS Voice Over Extra News. All the information you need for a successful voiceover career. A new article now on VoiceOver Extra reports that 10 women have charged Rofe with sexual assault in a class action suit that was filed in New York's Manhattan Supreme Court on March 6th against Rofe's company, PDR Voice Incorporated. Formerly located in Manhattan, Rofe moved his company and studio to a nearby Irving, New York in 2016. My aim is for Rofe to face public legal repercussions for his crimes, Engelman tells VoiceOver Extra. News media coverage is helpful, but trial by court of law is the way we recognize crimes in our society, she says. I want myself and other women to have justice. As reported earlier by VoiceOver Extra in recent months, many women have revealed being sexually harassed or assaulted by Rafe, who was a prominent voice actor, producer, and trainer in the New York City area during voiceover training sessions with him from the early 2000s to September 2017. His PDR voice website is no longer available. Engelman says that the late last year, the news about Hollywood's Harvey Weinstein's predatory behavior triggered a suppressed memory of my assault. I immediately told my husband and close friend, who both urged me to call a lawyer for the possibility of pressing criminal charges, she said. But the statute of limitations had just run out for her to charge Rofe personally. 
So Engelman's New York City attorney, Jordan Merson, took a different tact and filed a class action suit involving Rofe's company. We won't get into the gritty details here of what happened during the assault. That's in the article. But attorney Merson's charge is that the company, PDR Voice, had a duty to supervise Rofe's behavior and did not, which resulted in the sexual assaults. Merson says other victims of Rofe should know that for the first time, there is a path to justice that they can choose to take. And as unbelievable as this sounds to most of us, there is still ignorance in this world about who's truly at fault in cases of sexual assault. Peter Rofe was an incredibly smart manipulator, says one of the women in the class action suit. And I hope people don't blame the victims because trust me, we've blamed ourselves for long enough, for a long enough time. We don't need anyone else to do it for us. Information on joining the suit, plus an interview with Engelman and another woman who, who has joined the suit, is in the article at voiceoverextra.com. P.S. You'll want to check the Voice Over Extra website daily for industry's latest news and resources. Well, it's one of the heaviest pieces of news to hit our business. Boy. I think almost ever. Actually. Yeah. You know, it's made me, you know, think twice. I'm a big hugger. I'll even hug you a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, now it's like, you know, everybody's standoffish. Yeah. Is that going to make us less intimate in our society? I don't know. I don't know either. I think uh, we all just have to be way hell, a heck of a lot more sensitive, I guess, to these things than we ever were before. Yeah. Well, speaking about people, you were mm -hmm. around probably millions of people in Vegas last <laughs> week while you were at NAB. It was. It felt like it. Um, <laughs> No, I got to head up to NAB and um, was able to be accompanied with uh, by Maxine, and it was wonderful because she was there to help me shoot video. Video I have not yet gotten to produce, but there will be video on George the Tech, and I'll get the best pieces to air on the show. But some of the stuff that you might be uh, tuning in to see at some point, I had a great interview with Randy Thomas, who was there actually representing a podcast, and she actually did an episode of her podcast at the show. That was pretty cool. And I also got to see a few of the broadcast side of things in terms of mixers. Um, oh. one, of the, one of the mixers I looked at was from a company called Arrakis. And the reason I, I'm kind of gravitating or liked looking at those mixers, first of all, you're not going to see them at NAMM. Anything for radio broadcast doesn't show up at NAMM. So I was really focused on seeing what I could find at NAB that I was not going to see at NAM or AES. Because the thing is, if I get if I went right to the audio hall, I'd see the same stuff over and over same again. Booth, same booth, same guys. Four months ago, three yeah. months ago. Right, yeah. right. So I hung out in radio, and it was great because I did talk to some of these broadcast board makers. And the things that set those boards apart is they're designed for simplicity, first of all, which is, I think, what draws me to them mm -hmm. as a possible board for someone doing a voiceover studio or a podcast. podcast right you know they're very simple they don't have the rows of knobs that this board has for example this has got covered with knobs our board the xb10 made by alan and heath is this weird amalgamation between a broadcast console and like your traditional mackie mixer style thing with aux and sends and eqs and everything right and the boards i was looking at didn't have any of those it had a volume slider for each input. Right. It had an on button to turn on the channel. And they had three buttons at the top for program mm -hmm. and monitoring Correct. or cue, I Q, guess. Cue, right. Yeah. That's it. And so the, the simplicity record. of it is one thing that made it really, really appealing to me. But it was also the fact that these boards are made for extremely heavy-duty use. They're designed to be used day in, day out. And the, the faders, the little sliders, the buttons are of a high quality. that They should last for years and years without any problems. Which is the point with broadcast equipment. <laughs> right. So if you have a studio that does have the likes of a Mackie mixer, if that's the heart of your studio and buttons on it are getting scratchy and pots are getting scratchy, you feel like you have to replace it every, I don't know, three to four years, it might be worth the investment to go to a board like this. Mm -hmm. You're going to spend triple what a Mackie equivalent Mackie might be. Right. You know, these are $1,000 plus mixers, but you're getting simplicity, you're getting quality and consistency. So, right. and they all have USB inputs. Yeah. You know, they all have USB input and outputs. Right. They have extra bells and whistles like Bluetooth inputs. So, if you want to do your own cell phone as a phone patch, piece of cake. Why not? It's built right in. Bluetooth is in the board. So, there are some pretty cool features coming down the pipeline. And someone that needs to, 
do a little bit more complicated studios more than a typical voice actor might like something like that. Yeah. And you know, and speaking of on the road, uh, we ha we have the Harlan Hogan's uh, uh, set up here. He <laughs> loves to talk about how an ironing board is your friend in a hotel room. I have to agree with that. You know, we have and, made and, use of those in st for studios on the road all the time. Yeah. And for ironing shirts, too, which is really important for those big, important meetings. But uh, he's got his... Uh, his uh, the Porter Booth Pro. This is the Plus, actually. That's the Plus, The right. Plus, which is a great unit, and uh, but we can talk about that a little bit later yes, when can. we come to Harlan's commercial for VoiceOver yeah. Essentials. And the other thing I saw before yes. we run out is uh, Source Elements had a new version of their soft software called Nexus. It's Nexus 1.2, and yeah. what's cool about Nexus 1.2, okay, again, kind of a niche thing, but for people that do production, like podcasting or engineering and recording, you can have um, any software like Chrome, Skype, IPDTL show up as inputs and outputs in your DAW. Hmm. So like in Pro Tools, you could have a channel dedicated to Skype and it would have a dedicated input and output that sends audio back and forth between Skype and Pro Tools. So Skype, in essence, appears as like a plugin right. in Pro Tools. Cool. But the plugin is Nexus. So this is new. It used to be you can only have two pairs of uh, like a, two channels of audio assigned at any one time. Now you can have many channels of audio, all custom named, so you can keep track of what's what. So. What an amazing age we live in. <laughs> Nothing else they had at the show. They were ready to like, formally announce like it were two early days. But Source Connect 4 is in the pipeline, and there's going to be some pretty big innovations there. So when, those, when we can announce those, we certainly will. Well, clearly they're getting traction now with the product, with ISDN sort of slowly crawling off the cliff. It's not falling off. It's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Visden was a big thing there. As Good. usual, they were demonstrating Visden uh, they had their ISD, their, their telos there and they were doing dial up tests. Cool. And to, you know, to take it up a notch, they were doing it all over cellular modems. Ooh. So it was being, <laughs> yeah, inside it was, that hall. Yes. That's like a mile long. And, exactly. Oh, it's Christ. pretty darn impressive. So With anyway. everybody on their phone. <laughs> all righty so anyway we'll have some video of that in the future in a future show hopefully next week great can't wait to see it all right well we've got uh people have been asking about markers yeah so we're going to talk a little bit about markers in our next segment so stay tuned we'll be right back here on voiceover body shot minus four, are we at minus four db we're at minus four db on vobs yeah, hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Minus four, are we at minus four dB? We're at minus four dB on VOBS. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Minus four, are we at minus four dB? We're at minus four dB on VOBS. Hey, what question do we get the most often? Far and away, it's, how do I even get started in voiceover? And we have a great answer to that question. Take vo to go gos free Getting Started in VO class. You heard right. Free. Gratis. Nothing. It's available online 24-7 at gettingstartedinvo.com. That's gettingstartedinvo.com. If you've been watching VOBS and thinking that you need to get in gear and start your own voiceover career, this is the class you should start with. You'll learn about the vocal skills you need, the storytelling skills you need, the equipment you need, and the business skills you need, all in one single comprehensive online class taught by VO2GoGo's David H. Lawrence the 17th. This class won the Backstage Reader's Choice Award four years in a row, and again, there's no charge. It's absolutely free. Want to take it? Sure you do. Getting started in VO.com. That's getting started in VO.com. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. 
We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. All righty, we're back here on VoiceOver Body Shop, and, uh, you know, their phone never stops ringing. And the email <laughs> just piles up. I was troubleshooting something as we were prepping for the show. Uh, part of the reason we're late tonight. Yeah. Not the whole reason. But Whoever that was, it's your fault. <laughs> uh, anyway, but... Um, but, you know, it, it's not easy if you really don't know what's going on with starting a home studio. People are incredibly t intimidated by it. Yeah. And George and I like to make it easy for you. And one of the ways you can do that is by contacting one of us and hiring us to help you with your home voiceover studio. Mm -hmm. And if they want to work with George, what do they do? George? Well, they go over and visit georgethetech.com on the web. And uh, everything that you wanted to know about my services, how to get a hold of me, how to schedule me, uh, what types of services I offer, my rates, everything, it's over there. Um, and hopefully you'll find a service that fits your need. And if you don't, there's a little little, little uh, window, that window that pops up at the bottom right of the screen, the contact area. You can send me a note and we'll find you what you're looking for. Cool. All right. How about you, Dan? Well, George, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, all you have to do is go over to home, homevoiceoverstudio.com. Uh -huh. It's only one home. Homevoiceoverstudio.com. And uh, and I will, uh, I, I think both of us are probably the best people in the business when it comes to returning calls, answering emails, answering questions, uh, and teaching people how to do this properly. It's not rocket science, kids, but uh, we can at least are the rocket engineers that can make it not rocket science for you. The idea for us is to have learned the right and wrong ways to do everything so that we can distill all that information down and teach you exactly the right things that you need to know. Right. A lot of what we do is what's important is what we don't tell you. <laughs> A lot of yeah. what we, you know, that's a real important thing, like, you can tend to go out on the web and Google this stuff, and yeah, you're going to find a wealth of information, but you're going to find out a lot of stuff you don't need to know. Right. And that's going to overwhelm you. Right. So enough of the plug. I think they get the point. Okay. What are we talking about tonight? Well, tonight, pe people have been asking about marking their their waveforms. And here we have an example of, uh, this is uh, Audacity. Don't use the actual oh. marker on You, you didn't mean this? No, no, no. I meant markers where you can see things on the waveform in the dump mm -hmm. on, on your desktop. Now, Audacity is different from the rest of them. It is kind of different. Yeah. You do everything a little bit different right. over there. At now, Audacity. In Audacity, the, the way you do it is you add a, another track at the bottom here, which you can you can see here. And I mean, But once that track is go. in, yeah, I mean, you can you go to a certain place and you hit M and create the marker there. That's a label track. It's a label, which means you can actually go in there and label this as a label. Move them around. Yeah. But they're, they're designed to work with specific types of other programs. They're not flash cues. So they're, you know, maybe you can use them to, to mark where things are, but they're not really useful other than that. They stay within the world of Audacity. That is they, true. It's a proprietary marker thing for Audacity. Right. Whereas if you make markers in SoundForge, which is a two-track editor, or Twisted Wave, and here, or Audition, right. those markers that you see there, right there, no, the, right there, those markers there, those little red markers, they're going to show up in another editor like SoundForge or in Audition. Those right. markers carry along because they're embedded in the wave file itself. Right. And so there's a big difference between the two. Hmm. Frozen on us again because we're looking at Audacity here. You know, learning curve. Yes. But the point is, is that the, the, the another important point is that the Audacity markers, they stay locked in time with the timeline. So whatever wherever they are in the time, the markers stay put. So what happens is in Audacity, if you delete a chunk of audio, five seconds of audio, 
and everything moves together, right? It moves in time. Mm -hmm. In World of Pro Tools, they call it shuffling. It shuffles over. The markers stay where they were in the timeline. Right. So all of a sudden, they don't line up with anything on the audio track, and it can drive you insane. Whereas in something like Twisted Wave or Audition, right. those markers are really attached to the wave itself. Right. They're actually flash cues. And so and it's a standard thing throughout the throughout the industry that other computers and other software will recognize. When you say flash cues, is that like flash as in flash coding? Yes. Like uh, Adobe Flash? Exactly. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, right. exactly. So in Adobe Audition, they're great. And somebody showed me uh, something a couple months ago where you can actually create a marker and then create a range with that marker. And so if you're doing like three takes of a spot or something like that, and you do like seven takes, you pick the best three, you can put those markers over each one of those and so you just export by ranges. And it just, yes. And you can name those markers, and it's fabulous. Yes. And that is markers in a nutshell. And, and Audacity and Twisted <laughs> Wave. wave and, and, and that's how they all interact that's, with each that's other. That's how they all so. interact. Well, Scott... Scott Brick is, is sitting patiently by. Yes, he is. A real pro he is. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to get to talk to him about his career and all the cool stuff he's doing right now. And I know all those audiobook people out there just waiting with bated breath, whatever the heck that means, to talk to Scott here. So, maybe he can explain. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe he knows. He reads he's books. a smart guy. He's got book learning. All right, we'll be right back here on Voice Over Body Shop. Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality. Consult with someone who knows the truth. Someone who's been there, in the trenches, doing voiceover for over 30 years. Someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios, who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios. He knows how to teach and cares about your success. In one of the harshest environments known to voiceover, your home. Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the Home Studio Master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Drop off a specimen of your dry audio for a free... Hey guys, I'm here to tell you about our wonderful sponsors, Source Connect. Well, actually Source Elements that create Source Connect. And their software is the key tool you need to have in a professional voice actor studio, whether it's your home studio, a personal studio, a production studio, commercial studio. Every studio should have Source Connect at this point because it's becoming rapidly the standard for live voiceover recording sessions done around the world. It's quickly replacing ISDN. I think there's a sea change that we've seen, and now Source Connect is clearly the one that most of the big time studios and many smaller ones have adapted. So if you wanna get in on that and be available for more work, your agent maybe has told you if you don't sign up for Source Connect, you can't get this kind of work, Now's the time. You can go to source-elements.com and get a 15-day free trial of Source Connect Standard. You don't need Pro for VoiceOver, just Standard. And you can start using it right away. You don't even need one of those little iLock dongly things you've probably heard about. So go give it a try and Total Me sent you. And we're going to be right back with Scott and Dan here in the studio. We're back. You know, Scott Brick has recorded bestsellers and Pulitzer Prize winners for every major publisher, over 850 titles, including Mystic River, Fahrenheit 451, one of my favorites, mm -hmm. In Cold Blood, and Helter Skelter, in addition to over 50 Earphones Awards and Grammy a Grammy nomination. He also received five Audie Awards, including two for his work on the Dune Saga. Gee, we talked about Arrakis. I'm like, desert planet. <laughs> His work has been profiled in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and Entertainment Weekly. And in 2012, Publishers Weekly named Scott their audiobook narrator of the year for the second time. In 2015, Scott began teaching the nation's first fully accredited university course in audiobook narration at UCLA. And let's welcome to our show... 
Scott Brick, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah, we yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't <laughs> seen you since <laughs> since I was in Buffalo, I think, uh, the old show. Yeah, the, a couple times at the live appearances, at, yeah. you know, yeah. conferences. But yeah, those those were always fun. <laughs> so you, you're clearly an accomplished guy, you know, with with the audiobook business. But where, where are you from originally? How did you get into that? I'm from Santa Barbara. Okay, and, just, uh, just up the shore. Just <laughs> up the street a little bit. Yeah, about an hour and a half away. And uh, I went to UCLA as, a, uh, as an undergrad, and um, the friends I made there, we would play baseball every, you know, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And with all my stage work, they'd come to see me in, in, in a number of productions over the years. And uh, there was a guy who would play with us named Bob Westall. Blessings on Bob Westall. Yeah, that, that man will drink free for the rest of his life anytime I'm around. Um, he worked for a company called Dove Audio and uh, uh, said, you know, one of these days I should get you an audition, an audition for them. And I said, yeah, you should. And he finally, he finally did, and, you know, that was my first gig. Yeah. So, so how many books have you done? I don't keep a firm track. Uh, basically, I do a book every week. So... Every new year, I basically so add 50, 50 book to books. the title, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to the official tally, I should say. So but it's about 850, wow. more or less. Pew. That's a lot of books. So obviously you like to read. and I you do. And you get to read the best literature that's out there most they, of the time. They pay me to be well read. It's a very that's interesting cool. phenomenon, yeah. yeah. The, the audiobook business has gone through some major gyrations in the last few years. And of course... Maybe we're talking about two different businesses. A lot of people I talk to are like, I'm getting into redoing audiobooks, and they're they're doing the royalty shares, and they're sure. that's not the stuff you're doing. You're doing the stuff for the major publishers. and Mostly, but I do royalty share books occasionally. Yeah. Um, you just have to be smart about which you know, which ones you want right. to do. But yeah, I get, I get approached. Um, sometimes I'll do a... a, a Oh, God, uh, a hybrid deal. You know, mm -hmm. they'll pay me the per finished hour, but they'll also offer some of the back end. Right. Um, you know, I, at this point in my career, I, I want to work on the books that I love. Right. Uh, and you don't always get to do that. You don't get to do that actually well, anywhere near often enough. But, right. uh, uh, yeah, so I'm open to all of it. But primarily, most of the work I do is for the major publishers, yeah. Okay. So what is the state of the audiobook business? It continues to expand like the universe, or...? You know, uh, <laughs> Pat Fraley, one of my favorite people, uh, we, I heard him say once, uh, several times, uh, the current state of audiobooks and the work available in audiobooks right now, there hasn't been an opportunity like this for entertainers since the early days of film when they were still called the flickers. Right. And you had guys walking out to Hollywood Boulevard saying, you! You look like you could be a cowboy. I'll make you a star. Come on in. You know, <laughs> seriously, there are so many books out there that need to be done with self-publishing the way it is. Right. There's no way that you can meet the demand, the insatiable demand of you know the subscribers on Audible.com or on iTunes. So there's a ton of work to be had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, good paying work and not so good paying work. You know, that's the thing. That's yeah. that's why you know, a revenue share is going to be a risk because there's no track record. Maybe this right. guy is self-published. Maybe it's a debut novel and they have no no way of knowing how much it's going to sell. Yeah. What are you working on right now? You can't tell us? Or well, I can, I can tell you. Um, I'm finishing up tomorrow uh, the latest Tom Clancy. <laughs> uh, um, oh God, a point of contact? I Sorry, I'm t I, I, they kind of they kind of run run together. Uh, I've done so many of them over the years. Uh, I'm starting to get the titles confused. But I'm doing the latest uh, Jack Ryan and Jack Ryan Jr. book for Tom Clancy. Uh, I just finished up um, six Clive Cussler backlists, and I actually I can't talk about it yet. I'm going to announce it soon on my YouTube channel. Plug, um, but I just got cast this last week in one of the coolest books, one of the best-selling books of the 20th century. And I can't wow. talk about it yet, but I am looking forward to this like I haven't looked forward to a book in years. Yeah. Sounds like you really like these these spy novels and uh, that sort of thing. What What is the essence of those books that you like so much? Or you know, I, what I love, um, I love two things. I love it, uh, um, all, all storytelling is manipulation. I just, and, and I'm fine with that, just artfully manipulate me, you know. Uh, I, I I like it when when an author is able to do that. And right. Mike Madden, who's writing the uh, Tom Clancy series now, um, he's really good at that. And he's also really good at surprising me, which is again another thing I look for in a in a mystery or a thriller. Um, that's what makes me just 
excited to go to work every day. Yeah. It's all about storytelling. All voiceover is about storytelling. Even yeah. if it's 30 seconds or 15 seconds, you're still telling a story. Yeah. In the audiobook business, of course, it's telling a much longer story. Do you, I, I would imagine you read a whole book before you, you start to, to work on it. There's probably a whole production process to it. What's it like? Well, uh, it's, it's different on every, depending on the type of book. Um, right. You know, with a nonfiction book, basically, you need to just make sure that you've got all the pronunciations, in, you know, right? Because if it's a book about, you know, a war, you know how it turns out. Right. Um, but if it's fiction, absolutely, you, you know, read the book first. Um, sometimes I'm hiring people to read the book for me. Mm -hmm. who I'm giving you the cliff notes or <laughs> yeah because yeah. um i don't have the time to do all the research myself so i hire a i've got basically and i don't want to say like a full-time staff but i've got a number of vendors that i deal with all the time uh because if it's a, a whodunit you need to know who done it you know um you need to know who the red herring characters are so that right. you can make sure that you make them seem like they're the villain. Right. You need to know who the real villain is so that you can make them seem mild as mother's milk. So it's a huge <laughs> surprise. Um, so, yeah, you really do need to research uh, the entire story all the way through. Yeah. How do you like to tell a story? What's what's your process for? for I mean, you, you get a, these words in front of you. Somehow you're able to bring it to life. What, what, what do you think is, is one of your keys to doing that? You know, I know it's the million dollar question, but well, I, I do something and, and um, <laughs> some of my colleagues laugh at me, but occasionally I will uh, try to prepare myself, not just with the, the hard research and making sure that, OK, it's the city of Houston, but Houston Street in New York. You know, you go over <laughs> right, those right. little details, those pitfalls, but. You have to prepare the text, but I, I try to prepare myself. I try to prepare my mood. If I'm working in a genre that I'm not familiar with, I'll try to immerse myself in it. Um, and the story I typically tell is when I was recording a Richard Matheson book called Stir of Echoes, uh, which I had read when I was in college. It's uh, an amazing ghost story written in the 50s. And it's told first person. And it's just this descent into the terror of an adult who doesn't know how to help his child. He... Like most people, he does not believe in ghosts. And yet, his, his four-year-old son starts speaking in the voice of an 80-year-old dead woman. <laughs> so he becomes terrified as he tries to find a way to save his son's life. And so what I did in order to prepare myself, because I don't typically work in horror, um, the night I decided to record it at night. <laughs> and at about 9 p.m., I shut off all the lights in my big old echoing home, <laughs> and I watched... Uh, the Shining, <laughs> and I scared the crap out of myself. And, Here's uh, Johnny, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then I went downstairs, and at midnight, the very witching hour of the night, I started recording in my home studio, all alone, in the dark, because mm -hmm. I I knew that if I felt afraid, I would sound afraid. And uh, the next night, I did the same. I recorded till about five a.m., and then um, the next night, I watched The Ring. And I started recording again. And nobody who listens to that audiobook is going to go, ah, he watched The Shining or he, you know, he watched The Ring. <laughs> no, of course not. But audiobooks is, it's a type of storytelling where subtlety plays. And so you, little things like that, I think, make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you were a classically trained actor. You mm -hmm. were talking about that earlier. You still hit the boards at all? Or <laughs> You have the desire to go back out on I've stage? I've got the desire every day. Uh, yeah, I, d I did 10 years in a traveling Shakespeare company. I did a ton of classics. I played Cyrano at a theater in Santa Monica, <laughs> mumble, mumble, years ago. Yeah. Um, I haven't been on stage in, I think it's been 11 years. Yeah. Uh, I adapted some uh, uh, an Orson, Orson Scott Card short story for a, um, a night of short stories uh, written by, by Scott. And... Um, it's been since then that I've been on stage and I think about it all the time, but it's, you know, you, you play a role like Cyrano, you're, you're raising your voice, you know, yelling at times for three and a half hours, right. going into the studio the next day, it's problematic. Yeah. So, uh, one day soon, I hope to. Yeah. It's great fun. You when you haven't done it for a while and yeah. suddenly you're backstage again, you go, Oh, this is why I like this it. Is where, <laughs> this is where I feel at home. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, it's like stepping out into an aquarium. There's just, and there's like this magic behind stage. Yeah. It's like, yes. Yeah. But, you know, so maybe I can urge you to, 
do it again. Oh, I, in a heartbeat. That would be wonderful. Yeah. It's great stuff you can see here in this, you know, in Southern California. Oh, I know. Yeah, absolutely. So a great production of Don Giovanni over the weekend. Oh, did you? Yes. It was done in gangster, 30s gangsters. Seriously? Yeah. And they did it at a warehouse in like, in East LA. Is this still running? It's uh, next weekend. Oh, I got to see Pacific that. Opera Company. Go oh, that, that sounds out. wonderful. Get it on Gold Star. You'll yeah, sit in the I back, but you'll get to see oh, the Oh, who cares? Show. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, if you're just joining us and wondering what the heck is going on, we're talking with Scott Brick, who is uh, an acclaimed uh, audiobook narrator. And if you got a question for him, put it in the chat room. Bring it. Yeah. And uh, he'll be happy to answer it for us. So, uh just go to the chat room. Jack Daniel is as again as he usually is doing his amazing job as our social media director or social media social media social media czar. That's your official title. There you go. I'm good with there it. There you go. All right. <laughs> and he will relay that question to us, and Scott will answer that very question that you ask. Um, you're also teaching, mm-hmm. and uh, how many students are you working with these days? I teach the third year grad students at UCLA. Uh, in audiobook narration. There's a, it's, it's a class in audiobook narration. What are these people finishing up their grad work in that they would be? Uh, they're, they're in, it's in the theater department. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of crazy, especially for somebody who went to UCLA. Mm-hmm. The idea that, uh, I mean, I never went for an advanced degree. I never graduated, okay? You know, the idea that third-year grads can't get their diploma until they go through me, <laughs> that's just kind of crazy. Um but it's wonderful, and it's inspiring because most of them are, you know, at some point in their late 20s, early 30s, they've been in the workforce already and right. it chose to go back for advanced training. Uh, they're motivated, and they're so gifted. And so I get to work with them just one quarter a year, and I typically get eight students at a time. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, in addition to the, the weekend events that I do, seminars where I teach or private students. But, um, yeah, there's always a fluctuating amount. Yeah, having been a teacher, there's n- nothing beats if you're if you're a ham to start with, you know. If you're really a show business guy, getting in front of a class is like well, hey, you know. I tell you, you know, it's a cliche that you you never learn as much as when you're teaching. But I can tell you from personal experience, when I started teaching with when Pat Fraley invited me to teach with him the first time, I realized this is a man who has curricularized voiceover. Yeah. And and I it's when I started listening to, you know, the things that he was saying, he would point things out about my style mm-hmm. and he would say, you know, I've noticed that you do this mm-hmm. and I've noticed that you. That actually sounds like Pat. It's very <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Um, and whatever he would make an observation, I would say, of course I do. That's exactly what I do. And that's exactly why I did it. I'm just trying to keep up with him. Of course. Him. But since then, it's kind of tuned my my ear and my brain to notice that in in myself and in others. And uh, I don't know, I guess I became a disciple of, <laughs> of at least you know, his teaching method. And uh, it's really assisted me as I've been working with, with students. Yeah. Who are some other great people you've worked with that you've learned stuff from? Oh my God. Paul Rubin is a marvelous teacher. He's, um, he's a director in New York who you go to his house, go to his house, you, you, uh, we stay in his guest room, uh, typically whenever we head back to New York. And there's just something about, you know, being in somebody's guest room where with bookshelves all over the walls. And yeah, there's like a half a dozen audio awards, the audiobook industry awards. And, you know, it's nice to see those. But then there's also the three Grammys. Mm-hmm. Just hanging around. Right. You know, he uses it as a doorstop for his bathroom. You know, <laughs> not really. <laughs> but he's just, he's just, it's just that. He's just that laid back about it. And he is, uh, he's a marvelous teacher. And I remember, oh God, it was about uh, five, six years ago. Uh, he came to LA for the first time to teach a class. And I'd never worked with him because again, he's New York based and I'm in LA. And when I heard about it, I came out, uh, I, I came down there, I signed up and I show up and he says to me, how many books have you done? And I said, and I was like 500 at that point. Right. And he goes, why the hell are you here? And I said, because I want to get better. You know, I think uh, performers, you should never stop learning. Absolutely. You know, and any working actor in Hollywood will tell you that they've got classes they go to every week whenever they're not, you know, off on location. Right. So it's continuing education, and, and Paul is amazing. Yeah. And a lot of other the teachers, 
that I do, that I work with uh, fellow narrators, colleagues of mine, um, Johnny Heller, Sean Allen Pratt. Um, I've done events with them and, uh, you know, Sean Allen Pratt does a, uh, uh, his curriculum is, he teaches only nonfiction audiobook narration. And he's broken it down into like, you know, the five voices, narrative voices of nonfiction. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, you know, who comes up with this? Who right. curricularizes this kind of stuff? Um, I had to slip that word in a second time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really respect and admire that. And I learn a lot from them when, when we teach together. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a fun business. Oh, and I imagine that, you know, you... There are there other audiobook conventions aside from the ones in New York, and uh, that you actually meet audiobook fans or anything. Yeah, you know, yeah, um, uh, that's that's the big one. Uh, um, APAC, APAC, the Audio right. Publishers Association conference, and then I'll go to BEA, the Book Expo America, um, which is typically you know starts the next day, and I'll go and I'll do personal appearances there. Um, uh, I'm getting flown later this year to um, New Orleans, I believe, to talk about a couple of Eric Larson books, The uh, Devil in the White City and Dead Wake. And those are typically the, um, the events where I meet fans. Most of the audiobook conferences that I go to are things like, you know, you go to VO Atlanta and, right. and that's voiceover. And actually, Johnny Heller and I, we run a conference um, twice a year, uh, just, a, just a business conference, just the business of audiobooks. Because like you were saying, you know, Revenue share, how do you make that profitable? Right. So we put a whole panel together around that, around, you know, should you incorporate that kind of thing. But that's where you meet colleagues rather than right. fans. Yeah, and, and that, that's, yeah, and, and meeting the colleagues is half the fun of going. Oh, I know, yeah, exactly. exactly. Like, you, you, you get to go <laughs> hang out with people you usually only talk to online. That's right. Or on exactly. Facebook, yeah. You know, and you get to see them in conferences. Right, yeah. Again, we're talking with Scott Brick, and you got a question for him, throw it in the chat room. We're going to take a break right now, and when we return, we'll get to some of your questions, and we'll talk about all sorts of cool stuff, so... Skittles, taste the rainbow. She has fought for those who don't have a voice. The National Zoo. <laughs> because sometimes you just need to stroke a llama. Instagram. Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. $400 million. That's what the mayor wants you to pay for a new basketball stadium. Chickens were made to be fried. Sorry, buddy. KFC. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. <laughs> what? You've never seen a girl kill a troll? GameStop. Hey, I'm the cat meme guy. Come on, you know you love cat memes. Instagram, what's your thing? Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. Hey, you know, perhaps some of you recall putting the tie out on your dorm room to keep your roommate out for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking I about. I know, but when you're doing long-form narration like audiobooks, like Scott does here, it's sort of the same thing. Keep out, I'm busy. <laughs> and VoiceOver Essentials has the perfect answer. The LED multicolor recording sign with remote. Keeping the joint quiet is priority one, and letting the significant others in your space know that hey, I'm actually working in here, is critical. By the way, using certain color choices, because with this remote, you can you can change the modes on it. So it can be, you know, what, what, what uh, yeah, you can see it, it changes color fast, and you can keep it at one color. But here's the cool thing. You know, you can, you can actually create a code. Here, you can hold this for a second, Scott. Yeah, get, get a shot of two of us here. You can actually create a code where this thing is telling people stuff like you're taking a nap, you're recording, you're editing, you know, all sorts of stuff, you know. So that's a great point about the LED sign from voiceoveressentials.com. The multicolor voiceover recording sign, just $69.95, only from voiceoveressentials.com. And the best way to get to voiceoveressentials.com is to go down to the bottom of our page here that you are watching the show on right now and find the picture of Harlan Hogan talking into his wonderful Porta Booth Pro and it will take you right there and buy one of these and then buy one for all of your voiceover colleagues. 
that's it for, for Harlan Hogan this week. For seven years, he's been our sponsor. So thanks again, Harlan. <laughs> <laughs> Should be a there should be a spot in here. Oh no, you ran it. You ran it. That's right. We got questions there, Jack. Yeah. All righty, we're back here on Voiceover Body Shop, and uh, we're talking with Scott Brick, who's been with us a few times before. Yeah. And you know, it's not that we could ever run out of things to talk about because the voiceover business and the audiobook business, they they sort of. It's sort of like a Venn diagram, I guess yeah, is the right, best yeah, way exactly. to describe it. But uh, uh, do you do any other voiceover besides audiobooks? Yeah, I actually d I did a, a spot um, just after Christmas. I got I got to do uh, uh, like twelve different spots for Arby's, yeah. and uh, and I remember asking them now. <laughs> with the fact that I used to be a vegan, that doesn't disqualify me. They're like, no, as long as, let's just talk about meat. It's like, right. okay, great, um, you know. Uh, bank uh, uh, banks back in Georgia do you know spot radio spots for them. Right. Um, I just uh, did uh, um, narration for a film. I actually just did an on-camera gig, uh, both on camera and voiceover, uh, for uh, an indie feature that. Uh, oh, those are, those are always soon. fun. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a whole different world. And, yeah. But isn't craft service great? <laughs> <laughs> I'm an actor. I like free food, right? I would line my pockets with rubber so I could steal soup if I could. There you, you know? go. All righty. All right. We've got questions from our amazing audience who is incredibly patient. George, what are they? I'm still laughing about that. He's still on the <laughs> still stealing rubber. the soup. Yeah. The rubber. I, I remember somebody I know, her aunt, would carry aluminum foil lined big handbag. Yeah. Fill it up and walk out. Right. Um. In the audience questions, the first one I see here is from John C. And he says, for a newbie like me, demo for audiobook. This is, I'm just reading how it's written. <laughs> it's, it's for a newbie like me, dot, 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 demo for audiobook, dot, dot, that. Use a newer book or public domain, question mark, uh, or whatever works. What do you think? I think uh, you don't have to worry about, about rights uh, when you're doing a demo. No, not, not a problem, because you're not... You're not making money off of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it is understood. Uh, these are publishers. So um, they understand you're trying to break in. You're not trying to make money off of, you know, reading a minute and a half of. You it's know. fair use, as they would say. Yeah, it's I a guess. fair use. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so go with whatever suits your skill set, whatever, you know, demos from demonstrate. Use, pick, uh, pick material that where you can demonstrate your best skills. Mm. Okay. Okay. In, in, interesting to note that, you know, here's somebody talking about demos. Mm -hmm. What should an audiobook demo be like? You know, is it like uh, one good piece? Good question. Or, yeah, you know? I tell you, that's a whole episode. But uh, <laughs> uh, it is it's it is a lot different, uh, the way it sounds, from the typical voiceover demo, like an animation demo right. or a commercial, commercial demo. demo. You're yeah. going to hear sound effects and music and all that. Right. And I get students who send me their demo, and they've done that on their audiobook demo. I'm like, oh, what are you, are you kidding? <laughs> no, th they're supposed to sound different. Uh, so you need to have at least three tracks, maybe five. Um, complementing genres, you know, fiction, nonfiction, choose the others at will, young adult, spiritual, inspirational, whatever, self-help. Right. Um, Sci-fi, uh, the min you have to have the common denominator of, of any demo needs to have a scene, uh, contemporary dialogue between a man and a woman. That's the that's the thing that you lead uh. with, because the publishers look they're kicking the tires. You send them your demo, they're going to kick the tires. How does this person, you know, how do they do? Right. How do they tell a story? And the tire they're going to be kicking is character separation. They want to know how you do it. And there's no right or wrong way. They just want to know how you do it, what your way is. So show them on, mm -hmm. that, on that selection. Um, that's basically it. And don't worry about sound effects. Just, just read. Minute and a half, <laughs> two minutes per cut. You're good. There's no sound effects in audiobooks. No. I mean, when I would do them, I'm like, you know, this really needs a soundtrack. But they ain't asking for one. Right. So yeah, one's exactly. not going in there. Very rarely they, they'll put one in, like maybe 1%, 2% of the time. But don't do it on the demo. Okay. Next question. All right, next one comes from Thomas Mackin. And he says, do you have 
a regular sleep pattern. <laughs> <laughs> nice way of saying, do you sleep? Um, also, do you yourself... No, I think he's probably serious about that. Um, also, do you yourself get voice coaching still? And if so, from who? Maybe Pat? Um, I don't have a regular sleep cycle. I wish I did. I have insomnia instead. Um, I... Uh, it depends on how much I'm working, you know, the, if I'm under the stress of deadlines, yeah, it's definitely a lot harder to get sleep. Um, I don't do regular, uh, vocal coaching. Um, but you're right. Um, with Pat, um, I get enough tips and tricks, uh, both in terms of just, you know, uh, protecting my voice as well as learning how to use it. So, uh, I wish I had time for more, but I don't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jack Daniel, uh, who's sitting here and having... Jack? Yeah, he's actually here. I mean, he could actually ask the question. You can actually question. ask the question. He could actually <laughs> ask the question, but I'll ask it for him since he's he's sitting over there. Uh, interesting about using films as a mood prep. Do you do the same with music or other arts? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, Jack, I do. <laughs> um, no, I do. I do. If I'm not in the mindset... You know, I do whatever it takes to get me there. I've done sports bios. Uh, I did one about Joe Namath years ago. I watched so damn much football, which wasn't hard for me. Uh, it was it was great research to do. Um, I've done uh, books about uh, Babe Ruth, and I've gone and watched a ton of old footage. Um, I did a book that was, it was written like one of the old, uh, um, oh God, you know, His Girl Friday uh, um, wacky you know, uh, uh, screwball comedies. Uh, it was written like that. It was What Makes Sammy Run by Bud Schulberg. And the dialogue was so rapid fire. You know, staccato burst, rapid paced dialogue. He couldn't have been much older than 16 years old the first, time I, the first time I met him. Sharp and quick, Sammy Glick. Used to run copy for me. Always ran, always looked thirsty. So I, what I did in order to, to get into that cadence, because that's a cadence, they didn't even have it back then. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was put on back then. But... And so obviously it's not, it's not my normal way of speaking. Right. So what I did is I got a ton of old radio shows, which I collect, and I listened to Howard Duff playing Sam Spade, The Adventures of Sam Spade on the radio mm -hmm. in the 1940s. Because he had that, you know, Bogart-esque, you know, staccato burst, you know, thing himself. Come along and I'll tell you about the flopsy, mopsy, and cottontail caper. You know, that kind of that kind of delivery. And I would listen to it on the st in my car on my way to the studio. And then again, on my way home, just to make sure that that cadence, that rhythm was Im imprinted upon my brain so I could do it for six days straight. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. It really was. It was, sure it was one of my favorite gigs ever. That's cool. Um, also, uh, Scott, even the tr top trailer and promo people have demos. Is it the same for someone like you at the apex of the audiobook pyramid? <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of being there, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, I absolutely. I, I put together new demos uh, a couple of years ago, my commercial demo, my narration demo. I don't have an audiobook demo because, um, you know, at, at some point you kind of reach critical mass where your body of work becomes your demo. And every publisher understands that if if they're not familiar with my work and if they're thinking about hiring me for a specific type of book, they can go to Audible and or go to Amazon, which owns Audible, and click on the book, a, a similar genre, a, a similar book from a similar genre. They can click on that and hear a five minute sample of me reading that. So they can actually they can actually target my quote unquote demo, my body of work. Yeah. They can go look for, shop for what they want. Yeah. Do you have like stuff that's booked up for like the next few months or yeah, typically um, between work that I'm doing for the publishers, the, the front list books, uh, I'll get backlist offers. I just got um, this about a year ago. I was asked to do Clive Cussler's first six books because they, for whatever reason, maybe they were only done as abridgments. Excuse mm. me, originally. So uh, there was a British publisher, um, um, uh, Little Brown UK who asked me to do those. And I said, well, I'll, I'll fit them in when I can, but I got to do the new Custlers too. So uh, then, then, of course, the third type of work is working directly with authors or doing a you know revenue share. Right. Um, so it's like three different types of work, front list, back list, and my own personal stuff that I want to do. 
you know, if, if things are slow on the front list front, I just go to the other two, you know, parts of the workflow. In a yeah. nutshell, front list versus back list. Front list is us. a brand new book coming up. Front list means it has to be out by May 7th. Uh, they give it to you, uh, hopefully, a minimum of six weeks before, usually um, 12 weeks before. Mm. And you can do get it recorded, edited, all the post, have it ready to go. Um, a backlist basically means the author's previous fiction or nonfiction, the titles that people aren't clamoring for them only because they've been out for a while. They know they can get them anytime. Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, it basically means either new books or or the author's it's like previous in film, books. it's first run pictures. Right, yeah, first very run. much so. Yeah. What are you still working in this little tiny studio of yours? What, <laughs> what, do, you, what do you have in there? <laughs> uh, I've I've had so many people refer to it as the Harry Potter studio, <laughs> like I, literally under it, the stairs. Literally <laughs> under the stairs. Um, I. It's so funny because years ago, um, Tess and I were hosting a uh, uh, a potluck for the union. Every year we we host. For the union, we host a, a, a potluck for the whole narrator community in Los Angeles. And people, and quite often people will fly in from out of, the, from out of state or out of town if they want to meet the L.A. producers. And so this woman came, and she, she uh, uh, lived up north, and she, she didn't know anybody there. And so she got there, and she was feeling a lot of anxiety, and she started crying. Because she said, I don't know anybody, and I don't know who to ask. And I wasn't around. You know, Tess and I are off playing host. Right. So... Uh, I, I felt bad. I had no idea this was going on. Bless his heart, Pat Fraley sees her. And they're right outside my right outside my studio. And she's crying. And Pat goes over and puts his arm around her. And he goes, hey, hey, no, really, it's okay. And he tells her, there's there's people here. I'll introduce you to. And there, there are plenty of people that you can talk to <laughs> to make her feel better. He goes, and look, it, it could be worse. And he points to my studio and says, you could be recording in there. No. <laughs> and so yeah it's a bit bare bones but yeah. it gets you know i've had so many publishers who've seen it and they're like stunned when they see it and i say i know i i keep meaning to make an upgrade and they've actually discouraged me from doing it because mm. of the because of the way that it sounds mm. they're like no it sounds exactly the way we need it to don't don't change a thing sometimes and, there's just something about a certain space you know i, yeah. I saw a you booth, hit the lottery you know? i saw a booth in vegas last week it by all accounts, it should not have sounded good. For some right. reason, it was just the right dimension, size, shape, box, whatever. Yeah. And I said, I can't. There's nothing I can improve. It sounds great. <laughs> so you know. Yeah. You know, ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Well, exactly. And and the fact of the matter is, is except you know you've had publishers see it, but most people don't need to see exactly. how the sausage is made. <laughs> right. Yeah. You exactly. Know, I mean, it's. Uh... Yeah. Uh, that's accurate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's. Th Three more questions. All right. I, think, okay. I think we have time for them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Scott, or how are you it. doing? We're a little late than usual, so we can get these in, maybe. Um, Devox says, we all know about the difficulties and bad habits that radio talents have transitioning to normal VO work because mm -hmm. of the differences. Um, what are some issues that you've seen reasonably talented voice artists who've done voice acting for, mm -hmm. you know, um, adjusting to audiobook narration? Is there anything like a pitfall for those for that transition? Everybody has it. And I have it when I go to do non-audiobook work. You, you, you develop a rhythm, a cadence, a, a pace at which you usually, you typically work. Yeah. Um, what people start to expect from you, you typically kind of default into that. And so I'll be doing, you know, um, like an Arby spot or something. I'm like, no, I'm not narrating this. I'm just saying <laughs> um, But I work with a lot of guys who uh, came from radio uh, men and women who come from radio and uh, sometimes other types of narration. There was a guy who did a ton of Nature Channel, you know, History Channel, you know, uh, documentaries. And he was old school and he sounded like those guys who uh, back in the day used to do those Disney nature videos. Mm -hmm. you know, the beaver takes out his tusks <laughs> and he <laughs> chomps, beaver, chomps, chomps, chomps on the tree and it falls in the river. And he's painting a picture. Right. This guy, man, this guy, he was painting hard. And, uh, <laughs> and the hardest part of that day was to break him out of that cadence. Because mm -hmm. I said, you know, you're not, you don't have to paint the picture. The words are already doing that. Your work... Uh, to me, uh, audiobook narration is a dance. You're either working with a very strong partner or a weak partner. And women will tell you if you're dancing with a weak partner, you need to do more work. 
Yeah, let me um, lead. Right? I mean, well, <laughs> occasionally, yeah. But if you're working with a strong partner, you don't have to do a lot. So um, I kept telling him, you know, you got a really strong partner here. Don't don't do so much. Yeah, you're right. The beaver goes down the stream. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and, and finally, it was I was working that day with Renee Rodman. And I, and I was really new at teaching. Um, and she had been a, a lot more experienced teaching voiceover for, for years, even before she got into audiobooks. And she had this great trick. She said, um, while he's in the studio behind the... Uh, Behind the mic, she says, "Do you know any? Uh, do you do any impressions?" And he says, "No." She says, "Can you do any bad impressions?" <laughs> well, and of course. And he's like, "Well, uh, you know." And she goes, "Don't don't worry about the impression. Actually, it it, it helps if it's bad. Can you do uh, can you do Arnold? You know, give me just that Austrian you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger thing. You know, and 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 of course he's embarrassed, but he does it. And she says, "Okay, read the text by doing that." And he did, and he's like, this is ridiculous, what are we doing? And she said, okay, read it again now without it. And he didn't fall into the cadence. It was like a reset. It It was was a reset, and by going to Arnold's cadence and and his rhythm, (laughs) it showed him that there was something else possible. Yeah. Oh, man, that's wild. And I I always, I I, I love that. I try to remember that, and I I use it shamelessly and make it sound like it's my idea. (laughs) (laughs) I have another one from Lawrence Lewis. This one's from the Facebook chat. Um... How's your health? I ask since I've been listening to your narration of the PH Miracle, and it's been great for me. I hope you're doing well. I, uh, I so appreciate it. I appreciate you asking. I am uh, happy and healthy. I'm cancer-free. have been for, I uh, found out a little, about, little over two years ago, right before Christmas. So uh, I am grateful to all my doctors and everybody who helped me through and to Tess and to, yeah, to be able to get back. Um, it was a little, you know. Uh, I had to have surgery. I, I had my thyroid removed, and so it stretched my laryngeal nerves. Uh, so for about three months, I couldn't work full time. Um, you know, and you're stressed that <laughs> those nerves are going to snap. They, yeah. They're right on the thyroid. They have to move them aside so they can take the thyroid out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm back at work, uh, back to normal, and uh, grateful for every day I get to do this gig. Thanks for asking. I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't know how we can follow that one up. No, you really can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott, it has been a pleasure having you here. We I appreciate so appreciate your, it. Your no, patience I, I'm, with us. I'm, and, I'm grateful uh, to be here. Uh, do you mind if I uh, – there's an announcement I'm going to be making soon. That's right. On my uh, uh, YouTube channel. And it's brand new. When you go there, you're not going to see any videos yet because actually the inaugural video I'm going to do is the announcement of this project that I talked about earlier. One of the coolest books of the 20th century. Um that we're going to be recording about a week from now, and I'm going to take, I'm going to take the camera into the studio with me, and every day kind of make a uh, a diary about um, a narrator's diary going on this wow. journey. On this, wow. uh, it's a thriller, and um, but I'm also going to be on the on the channel. You can find it on YouTube. It's Scott Brick narrator, and um, I'm going to be doing a bunch of um, instructive videos, um, a bunch of ones for free. And some paid ones if people want to opt in for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I need to build up a certain amount of, you know, a, a base of subscribers. If you, if you would go and hit Scott Brick Narrator and, you know, click subscribe, it would help me immensely. Because that way I can actually get these out, these free videos out uh, I think I'll just to the general that population. Right now. <laughs> and I actually just joined in, uh, Instagram as well. I think, I think I had to go. There were too many Scott Bricks, so... <laughs> uh, my production manager, she went with the Scott Brick, and I said, "You're going to make me sound so self-centered," but that's, that's <laughs> the probably Scott more Brick, accurate. George the Tech, right? I mean, yeah, of course. You have to come up with something, right? <laughs> it's it's a valuable tool. That <laughs> the absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for our interview, Scott. That's great. I, I mean, so appreciate it. And are you doing any private coaching or? I'm doing. Yeah, I'm doing a um, private coaching. Matter of fact, I got a. Uh, um, I've got an in, uh, an in person somebody coming to my studio on Monday. Um, I do a ton of stuff online. Uh, people can book on my website. It's uh, scoprick.net or scoprickpresents.com. Either one of them goes to the same spot. I'm actually doing a webinar on uh, um, uh, Open Coaches uh, coming up. Uh, it's going to be May 19th. The, uh, the page for that actual webinar isn't live yet. It's being built as we speak, but it should be, should be ready to go in the next day or two. 
May 19th, the Saturday afternoon, if you'd like to come join. That's going to be all about, um, I've got a thing that I try to uh, teach. I call it put yourself in the text mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, what, what makes your read more personal and more unique than anybody else's is depends on how much of yourself you put in. So that's what we're going to be talking about that day. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful being back. All right. Great to meet you guys. All right. George and I will be right back to wrap things up right after this. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Um... And we're back here at VoiceOver Body Shop. Our thanks again to Scott Brick for, you know, it's always great having him on oh, here, yeah. and, and and it's fun, and it's it's great to learn all this stuff. Uh, next week on this show, on this very VoiceOver Body Shop show, we have a legendary agent. Name has now been announced. Yes, Ilko Drostowski. Oh, who, very cool. Who announced that he's retiring. Oh, no way. So that's going to make a much more interesting interview. Tell us about what your career was like and what should people be doing and stuff like that. That ought to be some great questions. See, retired uh, voiceover or any kind of retired agents are great because they no longer, they can be a little more <laughs> candid. Yes. Let's put it that way. Yes, we'll see how true. candid he can yeah. be. April 30th, Kristen Lennox and her daughter will be here. We have to get her daughter's name, so I just don't, it's like she's just some yeah, generic daughter. daughter. You know. She actually is an actor herself. Yeah. Right? May 7th, Keith Farley will be here. May 14th. Yeah, cool. Keith. All right. May 14th, Dan Nectrap will be with us. That one does we... narration and promo stuff. Yep, we just added that one. Yeah, and May 21st, Thanks Harry to... Dunn promos at the CW. Fantastic. All right. Uh, who are our donors of the week? Well, names I've seen popping up in the last week include Maria Mackis, Andrew Kaufman, Eric Aragoni, Sarah Borges, and Antland Productions, who is our old pal, Uncle Roy. Yeah. Those are all regular names. So all those folks are subscribers to the show using PayPal, and they, they donate on a regular basis, and we really appreciate that. All righty. Um, you need help? Come to me. Home Studio Master, you go to homevoiceoverstudio.com. And for George? It's georgethetech.com or georgethetech.com, depending on the proper way of pronouncing. There is no that, proper that way. Article. We should ask. No, never mind. <laughs> uh, you also have a new audio geek podcast. Yeah, we've done a handful of episodes now. We did our last one at NAB, um, or actually at a studio in Vegas about NAB. Um, it's called the Pro Audio Suite. And it's definitely, a, a, we focus more on tech. All of us are audio engineers or techs on some Geeks. level. Geeks. <laughs> uh, two Aussies and two Americans. It's me, Darren Robertson, um, Andrew Peters, and uh, Robert Marshall from Source Elements. So go find that on your podcatcher app on iTunes. It's called The Pro Audio Suite. All righty. Uh, the show gets popped on to uh, YouTube by sometime tomorrow morning, depending mm -hmm. on what time I get up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, along with that comes the show logs. Mm -hmm. that Jack, That's right. uh, Jack DeGolia continues to write for us and gives you a rundown of everything that was said as it was said at the time we said it. It's very amazing. <laughs> it, time it, stamped. So you can jump right to that spot in the show. That's right. Uh, also, oh, and you can access them. I think they're up here somewhere <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the website. You know, we're at, we actually have a new website we're going to be putting out very works. shortly. It's in the works. We have a little bit more functionality. A little easier to use, a little more mobile friendly. Hopefully a lot more mobile, mobile friendly. Mobile friendly, yeah. yeah. Because I know a lot of you out there want to be able to watch the show live on your mobile phone or 
Watch the replay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're live every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific time. If you happen to be in the greater Los Angeles area and you would like to join us here at our secret location in Sherman Oaks. Um, all right. Well, they've cut it down a little bit now. Uh, write to us at the guys at VOBS.TV and tell us how many in your party. And uh, we'll give you the secret handshake and let you come by and watch the show live, which is a lot of fun. We'll raise the portcullis. Yes. Yeah, we can actually put the audience cam on right now. Uh, <laughs> show who's who's actually here. They can wave when it comes up there. Uh, Hopefully it's still working. No, it's it's got to be there somewhere. The... Oh, okay. Oh, you got to sit down a little bit lower. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, there, there's our, oh, there's our the, voluminous it's, audience. It's the love seat cam. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize it was such a tight shot. <laughs> All right. Also, also, please show us your booths. I mean, here's 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 Har Harlan Hogan's you know mobile rig on an ironing board. We could do better than that. We can folks. do much better than that. Not that that's not cool. I no, mean, it's, it's true. Uh, but we would like you to send those into us uh, again. The same address is the guys at vobs dot tv. So uh, you can get your booth on here. Take them landscape, Lance not portrait. Gate, that's right. Why? What is with you people? I don't know. Uh, all right. We need to thank our sponsors, like the amazing Harlan Hogan and voiceoveressentials.com. Voiceover Extra. Source Elements. VO to go go. Voiceactorwebsites.com. And J. Michael Collins Demos. All righty. Well, we need to thank... Marcy for letting us be out here late into the night mm -hmm. out in the garage. She's like, what's going on out there? Uh, our producer, Catherine Curridan, for getting us great, great guests like Scott Brick and the great lineup we have coming up over the next couple of months. Yep. Uh, Jack Daniel. Jack Daniel for an amazing job in the chat room tonight. And he's also helped us find some guests as he well has, along the has. way. So that's like, been fantastic. Like Scott. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, also, our amazing technical director with the patience and an iron will, uh, Sue Merlino, for uh, getting things done tonight. Uh, Jack DeGolia for the show notes. And, of course, Lee Penny simply for being Lee Penny. Well, that's going to do it for us. You know, this is not an easy business. This is an easy show to do. But <laughs> no. we're here every week to help you out with your home studio stuff and bringing you the best people in the business to tell you what it takes to succeed and have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So that's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Woodham. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. BS. Right. See you next week, everybody. Ciao.